Please welcome Rear Admiral Timothy Gallaudet, Oceanographer of the United States Navy. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, just by way of introduction, I, I preparing for this conference, I was speaking to my wife, uh, Karen, this morning, and she's a former naval uh, scuba diver, as well as oceanographer student, student. And I, was, I said, Karen, you know, how, how am I even going to match following up Leonardo DiCaprio, best actor winner? And uh, she said, well, honey, your ship didn't sink. <laughs> so that's not bad. But, but really, if uh, you know, this is just moderating a panel. It's not really what I call tough and arduous duty. If anybody saw The Revenant, that was some pretty tough duty. <clears throat> but I'm pleased to join you today in uh, moderating this panel for fisheries for the future. Uh, the role that fisheries play in our daily lives of, across, of, of people across the planet uh, cannot be underestimated, and, and it can't be ignored. Globally, more than 3 billion people, 3 billion people, depend on fish as their key source of protein. And the global fishery industry generates hundreds of billions, billions of dollars annually. So on this panel, we'll learn about the opportunities and the challenges facing the future of fisheries, from the importance of fish as a source of nutrition to the environmental and economic forces that drive fish fisheries sustainability, including the threat of illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, which I'll refer to in this panel as IUU fishing. This saps billions of dollars every year from legitimate fishing communi communities, uh, as well as uh, economic uh, prosperity for many nations. Uh, we'll also have the opportunity to explore the human rights aspect of fishing, from challenges facing Indonesia as it seeks to regulate IUU fishing within its exclusive economic zones, and Ghana's work to implement the Port State, uh, Port State Measures Agreement, which you just heard about, to uh, even uh, investigative reporter Ian Urbina's experience tracking illegal fishing and its human toll uh, throughout the world on the high seas. So the range of challenges facing the sustainability of fisheries was at the forefront of Secretary Kerry's thoughts when he announced the Safe Ocean Network just last year in Chile at the 2015 Our Oceans Conference. And since that initial announcement, we've seen the Safe Ocean Network grow to a global coalition of 25 governments and 20 intergovernmental and non-governmental organizations, all dedicated to enhance action, coordination, and cooperation in the fight against IU fishing. Now we must move forward to build this enduring framework that will provide a solid institutional structure for the work to, con to continue. Now, I'm sure some of you are all wondering, why is a US Navy admiral here talking about illegal fishing? And uh, the truth of the matter is it's extremely important to national security. I, I think you all heard the president mention that today about the, the health of our oceans mattering for national security and, of course, our economic security as well. And the Navy does much, much great work to advance the cause in fighting IUU fishing. Uh, we've done this through partnerships with many nations. We have maritime security initiatives that we've com com are, are underway in the Gulf of Guinea. Uh, that have uh, also occurred in the Oceania region. And we're just starting a, a major initiative that the Defense Department has funded up to $50 billion just this past year for marita a maritime security initiative in a Southeast Asia region. And we, we do much to support this through the detection and the monitoring of illegal fishing using our very vast maritime domain awareness capabilities that, and, and surveillance assets on the sea, uh, on the air, and even under the sea. So the Navy is very invested in this very important area. And, it, and the whole key is it is that this will build our regional partnerships and advance collective maritime security. So on that note, please, uh, I hope you enjoy this panel. And I will ask you to join me in welcoming the panel members, which I'll introduce right now. So first off, we have Dr. Jorge Tora. He is the executor, executive director and co-founder of the Community and Biodiversity Civil Association in Mexico. Uh, next, we'll have Ms. Uh, Jen Kimmerly. She is the Director of Global Fisheries and Aquaculture at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. <laughs> then we'll have Minister for Fisheries and Aquaculture Development of Ghana, the Honorable Sherry Aite. <laughs> A 
I, I challenge you to find a more lovelier dress on anybody in the audience right now. <laughs> and then we'll have uh, Ian Arbina, the investigative reporter with the New York Times. <laughs> we also are honored to have the Minister, Minister of Maritime Affairs and Fisheries of Indonesia, Minister Susi Pujiastuti. Secretary of the Navy Ray Mabus just met with Minister Susi uh, recently and called her a uh, fireball, which, which is a compliment because she is all about action. And lastly, uh, or actually the, our first speaker will be the Honorable Dr. Rashid Sumelia. He is the Director of Fisheries, Economics, and Ocean Canada at the University of British Columbia. Yeah, thank you so much. I think I'll leave my thank yous at the end because time is running out. Right, first of all, I don't know how you interpreted President Obama's talk, this, the way he finished it. And I was sitting there, and all that was ringing in my head is, yes, we can. Yes, we can deal with the ocean problems, and that is it's beautiful to see him after about eight years as President of the United States in the 2000s, right? Still having that fire, that was beautiful to see. Now I'll go quickly, I have a few points, I'll come back to thank yous. My first point is that the living ocean, the living part of the ocean is important for people. As an economist, I'm going to stress mainly the people side. It's not because I don't care about the, the life, the, the, the nature itself. And why do I say that? That means that we cannot afford to let our oceans die. You know, you know you can have a dead ocean, you can have it, but what will that mean? Don't let our oceans die. And this is why I say this. Each year, we take out about 120 million tons of fish, legally and illegally, out of the ocean. Now, to make this picture clear in your mind, this is like pulling out 120 million mature cows out of the ocean each year. Right? That's the equivalent in weight. Think about that. That's more than all the farms we, we slaughter from our, 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 all the cows we slaughter in, in our farms. Now, you see the food security consequences of this right away in your, in your head. But that also means we have to think about the ecosystem. What kind of system can sustain that amount of mass coming out each year out of it? And this is why Putting up marine protected areas, for example, is important to help us sustain the oceans. Now, these 120 million tons generate revenues for the fishing sector of about $120 billion, right? If you take in the added value, if you take in the added value of this, this comes to almost $400 billion, pumped into the global economy. Even for the United States, this is a lot of money, right? So. So that is law. Now, one function that the, the oceans provide to us, which to me is very close to my heart, is that one of our studies, we showed that about 260 million people generate some income and livelihood from our oceans through fisheries. 260 million. If you look deep into the data, the top 10 countries are actually large developing countries. You have Indonesia, you have the Philippines, you have Nigeria, right? And to me, this is the biggest service we get from the ocean. Tens of millions of people, especially young men, would have nothing to do if not for the fish. You know, most of us are surprised how Obama's hair has become gray, right? I tell you, if these guys didn't have fish, there will be more gray hairs on the president and the secretary and all of us, right? So this is a huge service, security side. We have to maintain this, all right? Now, I've talked about this in terms of what it does for us, but really, these oceans are under threat. This ocean, you've heard a lot about this, the fish, we're taking out the big fish, the more valuable fishing down, the food web. Uh, the oceans are warming, acidification and so on, pollution, and this is, these are topics for this meeting, that's great, oil spills, and you hear about empty oceans. And all of these effects are actually impacting the fish stocks. These are diagrams, both from the FAO and from our group at UBC, giving you just a picture of what is happening from the 1950s. And the trend is clear. We are losing more and more of our fishery resources. 
And I think President Obama also said something. He said, you know, our contest with the ocean, we cannot win it. We cannot win the contest because the impacts are going to hit people. Down there you see somebody, that's all the fish I get. That is almost a question being asked there. And the lady you see there is a migrant, you know, an environmental migrant leaving her her home and community because the fish are gone and other environmental impact. So these have real human consequences. Now, I'll spend a bit of the rest of my minutes to talk about illegal fishing is widespread. You see the map and economists will tell you this is because uh, the economics is good for them. We have to make the economics bad for illegal fishes. Just catch them and penalize them enough to make it not economic. And on the other side, this is subsidies. Everybody knows in this room has heard about subsidies. Many of us don't like it because it leads to overfishing, the, the capacity enhancing one. Work we are doing now with my group is showing that actually only a small fraction of this amount goes to small scale fishes. About 85% goes to the large scale. And we know one of the global problems we face is actually inequality, right? You hear it. The 1% thing, we're doing that with our own funds. Why do you do that? And making small scale fisheries unviable. So these are uh, two things. I would like to close with, the, with this picture, right? You look up here, just take a look at that animal, right? Hanging on the last eyes, and look on the other side to see that couple so happy to have their fish, right? I think these two pictures say a lot. We have to keep the oceans alive. All right, so let's all get to work. Already good stuff are happening, and I hope we'll go on. I'll take a few seconds just to thank the Secretary of State, his team, his undersecretary, for giving me this platform. I'm so humbled. This is amazing, actually, to get to address a group like you. Thanks for your attention. But I also want to thank you guys for giving me the chance to stand here a few hours after President Obama has just given his talk. He's my personal hero, you know that? That's <laughs> my personal hero. And I know there are millions of people, Americans and around the world, to whom President Obama is a hero. He's a big hero. One last point. I mean, you have to have a reason for calling somebody your hero. And there are many reasons. We saw one when he gave the talk. The Secretary of State is a hero, definitely. I mean, these are our leaders who are doing a wonderful job. And I want to thank the, the team again for allowing me to do this. And I said it's because he's my hero. The reason Obama is a hero for many of us, he has shown at the highest level possible that no matter where you are born, no matter how you are born, if you push hard, if you have a good heart, if you love humanity and everybody, even the sky cannot be your limit. Thank you very much. <laughs> well done. Uh, well done, Dr. Samala. I think you are now a hero to many in the audience. Uh, please let me introduce and call to the stage Minister Susi. Excellency, ministers, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished delegate, Indonesia as a country with more than 17,000 islands and having the, the world's second longest coastal line, oceans played a key role for Indonesia continuing growth. In the effort to achieve the visions of our president, making the seas as the future of the nation. Me, Minister of Marine Affairs and Fisheries of the Republic of Indonesia, set its missions on the three pillars of national fisheries management, sovereignty, sustainability, and prosperity. However, the depletions of marine resources due to the climate change and the practice of illegal fishing in the two decades had been hindered Indonesian ocean potential, distorting the economy and also damaging all the marine resources. In the last two decades, Indonesia lost almost 50% of each fisheries household. 
We lost from 1.6 million to only left 800,000 fisheries household. And we also lost the purchase index of the, our fisheries household almost 10% every year. We have 37% of our children born stunting in the last one decade. The FRO State of World Fisheries Aquaculture and the most recent study of University British Columbia, Canada, state that the climate change will severely affect developing countries that are dependent on fisheries, food, and revenue. Climate change caused rising temperatures, but the illegal fishing had been losing, had been making us losing almost 20 to 30 billion dollars a year. With almost two decades, more than 10 to 15,000 illegal, illegal vessels had been, had been catching illegally our fish in Indonesian water. It is not easy for big country like us and very small and very lack of capacity on monitoring and also patrolling. Understanding the, the problem that had been happened for two decades, we cannot start from from, from a part of cracking down from all, all the side. So we do enforcing our, our regulation of number of 29 of 2000, uh, number 45, 2009, to be able to sing every single boat that catch our, our fish illegally. And from the last two years, we had uh, seen a very good revenue and it's very good also uh, recovery on our sources. First, we are doing the moratorium of uh, illegal, uh, uh, moratorium of ex foreign vessel, and then we also ban the transshipment. While the one year temporary moratorium, we see that the illegal fishing is not just about catching fish illegally, but also its human trafficking practices, also the drug smuggling and also other rare or very in, in, uh, endangered species, the birds, the crocodile, and also many other animals from Papua New Guinea. There are many other laws that we have, uh, we have seen also from the illegal fishing practices. We also lost our 37% of our national fuel consumption used by all this illegal fishing. In the result, I would like to share with all of you here that uh, Combat IUU fishing with almost zero tolerance, it's give us a bright uh, pictures and numbers. In the last one and a half year, the GDP of fisheries also increased to 8.96%, almost double than any other sector or national GDP. The second, the fisheries household purchase index power increased from 102 to 110, which is almost 10% increase. We save 37% of our national fuel consumption, which is almost give us $7 billion on saving our own fuel. They're not only stealing our fish, but they're also using our fuel to steal our fish. Other than that, we also uh, enforce on the human, uh, human rights uh, uh, regulation because of what we have found in Benjina Islands with the practice of human trafficking. We repatriate 1,152 Myanmar and Cambodians from Benjina Islands, but we also seek for another 400,000 of Indonesian seamen out there that working in illegal fishing practices. We only have registered less than 200,000 Indonesian seamen work, but we know there are more than that. There are about 400,000 Indonesian seamen work in other parts of the world, not in Indonesia. While the practices in illegal fishing in Indonesia use other nation seamen to work in our water. By banning transshipment, we finally can see those vessels are, are basically practice the illegal fishing in our water, not before. We joined the PSMA, the Port State Measures Agreement, but we also understand that there are more homework to do for all of us. The Port State Measures Agreement is helping us to monitor the fish that catch illegally while, while they land. But many of them, they have find a way 
to not never port and never, never basically, obviously or clearly bring and brought their fish legally. So they will always find a way to always avoiding the legal that the action that we would like to take. Indonesians are very com committed into fighting illegal fishing by also finding the Tax Force 115 to fight illegal fishing in, in one roof, all join institution, the Navy, the police, Marine Police, the Fisheries of Marine Affairs, the Attorney General, and also all other elements of the institution on the Tax Force. And we also believe with all together work, as what Mr. President Obama said, that we, we are, that we want, we can, we together, we can. But, of course, we see the challenge, we see the, 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 the big business behind it is a track to go back. They approach our sustainable management on fisheries that we do right now as disconstructive to industry. They want to allow the foreign fishing vessel that had, that had been stopped in the last one and a half year to go back to catch because they say we need more raw material. But all this foreign vessel that, that so far had been practiced in Indonesia was basically duplicating their license more than 10 times they had. The Indonesian had been issued 1,300, but in practice, in reality, there are more than 10 times vessels are catching illegally in our water. So, distinguished delegate, ladies and gentlemen, that's what so far I can share here, and I would believe with joint communica and strong working together to push the illegal fishing as not only just just a fishing matter, but also a transnational organized crime. We learn from several vessels or ships that we catch. They have more than six flags, even one with 32 flags. So they have many flags of convenience on practicing their catching fish illegally. They have many nationality on, as a seaman. They have uh, an, just an example, the, the Viking that we catch in in, in Indonesia water, we, they have a Chilean as a captain, Ecuador as the engineer, and there are few seamen from Myanmar and from Indonesia. So this is a transnational organized crime that we all have to fight together. By classifying illegal fishing as a transnational organized crime, it will make us easier on combating, on fighting these practices. They, they're taking your reefs, they're taking your coral reefs that we will need for our future, for our fish to grow, to recover. When everything is fished out, there's nothing anymore to recover. And I do need all support from all of you here to continue to pursue, to promote the illegal fishing as a transnational organized crime. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Minister Susi. Thank you for your leadership and, more importantly, your results. And that was a perfect introduction for our next speaker, Mr. Ian Urbina. So my name is Ian Urbina. I'm a reporter with The New York Times. Um, in my allotted six minutes, uh, I was going to try to answer three basic questions. One was, uh, what was this series that we ran and is still ongoing, The Outlaw Ocean, about? Um, the second question was, uh, what were sort of some of the high altitude big thoughts that emerged from the reporting? And then the third question was, um, where might there be sort of rays of hope um, for fixes to some of these problems? Um, the series uh, set out to explore that space that is two-thirds of the planet and in many ways is in many places ungoverned and ungovernable. Uh, and more specifically, it set out to um, broaden the diversity of understanding about the types of illegality that exists out there. So apart from just, uh, um, you know, the Captain Phillips Somali piracy type story, um, intentional dumping or um, illegal fishing even, we wanted to explore the broader range of crimes. 
um, in the end or thus far, uh, that spectrum looks like um, the murder of stowaways uh, where stowaways are found and set on a raft far off from shore, cut loose and left to die. Um, a fairly organized realm of gun trafficking uh, and privatized maritime security, um, floating armories that exist out there usually on the line between national and international waters, largely unregulated, uh, sometimes quite violent. Um, intentional dumping on an order that shocked us. Um, you know, every three years ships dump in the oceans more oil and sludge than the Exxon Valdez and the BP spill combined. Um, uh, obviously illegal and overfishing um, uh, and a variety of other crimes. Um, so it was a real eye-opener as to man's inhumanity to man um, uh, that occurs offshore. Um, some of the bigger sort of uh, meta thoughts that emerged. One for me was um, something I still struggle with, and that is the definition of IUU, illegal, unregulated, un unreported uh, fishing. Um, what emerged as a tough um, thought experiment for us was what really constitutes illegal fishing, and more specifically, uh, as we, the globe, and nations in particular, and the consumer, uh, attempt to grapple with uh, better policing against illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, does that def definition include the plight of those who work out there? Um, so do the fishers matter as much as the fish? And by that I mean um, questions that might uh, cross the threshold of illegality uh, that would include the fishers, the fishermen and women, um, are they documented? Were they trafficked via debt bondage? Um, did all of them show back up at port? Did some disappear en route? Um, were they beaten uh, on the ship? Uh, um, what sort of violence exists? Ultimately, were they paid? Um, what were they paid? These are tough questions, and they're questions about the people on deck. Uh, and most of the discussion I found of IUU tends to focus, and for lots of good reasons, uh, less on the people than on the marine environment and the environmental questions. Um, that struck me as a big um, problem uh, and something that definitionally I think the community is going to have to struggle with. I think the second question was the, si the perennial silo problem, and this exists in the U.S. government, it exists in all governments, and it exists in the industry. And that is, it typically looks like well, we are the agency that just look out for fish, and it's hard enough to figure out if those 200 pounds, 200 tons of tilapia are really tilapia, and where it was caught, and whether it was caught with the ship that was permitted. That's a tough enough question in the supply chain. Uh, to now add to the question whether those deckhands, you know, were legal and abused or not uh, is a tough thing for one agency to take on. The next agency says, we just work on human rights, and usually we're on shore and we don't get invited to the meetings that are offshore. Uh, the third agency says, look, we're promoting trade, trying to better everyone's stake in life, and you bog these things down with too many rules, um, that deal won't go forward. Um, and on and on, um, and I do think that this conference is probably the prime place where uh, the blue-green divide, if you will, and these questions will have to be confronted. Hope. Uh, not a currency I usually peddle in. Um, uh, I focus on the negative stuff. Um, uh, but uh, I do think there is hope. Um, I do think that in the last year, um, driven by many of the people in this room, uh, there's a lot happening uh, in the realm of seafood traceability. Um, I do also think that it's probably going to emerge, or is already emerging in a sort of combination of the market, consumers, industry, and governments uh, that seek to um, push into place not just rules that dictate, you know, was that drift net caught or unpermitted, but rather was there a crew manifest uh, on that ship and was that ship, did it have tracking, you know, AIS, VMS, um, all these sorts of questions. Um, and so I guess I will finish by saying um, in the realm of hope, uh, I think that there are large stakeholders in the room, governments included, who are big buyers and buyers can often dictate purchasing policy. Uh, and purchasing policy is often what drives the market. Uh, and so in my final 30 seconds, I'll say, um, I think in terms of hope, 
the buyers, uh, be they government um, or others, all the way down to consumers, asking more questions about uh, both the conditions below deck and on deck um, is probably where we might see the most uh, change coming on these issues. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Ian. You uh, remind me of a quote I heard, and that's, leaders need to be brokers of hope, and they can never appear to be bankrupt. So I think you've definitely inspired us to that. Uh, I'd like, next like to introduce uh, Minister Aite. Thank you, Your Excellencies. Um, like to bring greetings from Ghana to say thank you to the U.S. government and Secretary of State. And I'd like to say some few words about sustainable fisheries in Ghana and the efforts that we're doing for management and for interventions. But I'd like to focus on two key areas, implementation of the post-state measures agreement in Ghana and development of a strategic framework to protect the marine environment. In Ghana, the fishery sector earns us over a billion dollars a year. Uh, it contributes to about 4.5% of our GDP, and it employs directly or indirectly about 2.4 million people, uh, making about 10% of our population. And significantly, the sector also contributes about 60% of our protein intake. Ghana has experienced a steady decline in the fish landed from ocean fisheries for some time now. Improving our management of fisheries and fishing are critical to our socioeconomic development. Although Ghana gave approval for ratification of the Port State Agreement, and the accession to the UN Fish Stocks Agreement in July 2016, actual implementation has far been ahead of the ratification process. I wish to share with you some of the initiatives that the Ministry has undertaken in pursuit of conservation, sustainable use of marine resources. In 2014, we developed our national plan of action to address IEU fishing, which identified existing gaps in relation to combating IEU fishing and proposed remedial steps to increase deterrence. In Ghana now, for example, violations attract a minimum penalty of $1 million and a maximum fine of $4 million. In 2013, we established a fisheries management unit with personnel drawn from the fisheries ministries, Ghana Navy, and Marine Police. The FEU coordinates enforcement of the fisheries laws in Ghana, which has led to a marked reduction in fisheries infraction. All Ghanaian vessels and industrial vessels now have vessel monitoring systems, and automatic identification systems tracking devices in all vessels, Ghanaian and foreign flag vessels are tracked 24 hours a day, seven days in a week. By the end of 2016, the semi-industrial vessels will also be equipped with AIS. In collaboration with our partners, Ghana has implemented the JEF funded ABNG, Area Beyond National Jurisdiction Project for Sustainable Management of Tuna Fisheries. Tuna actually contributes most as 70% of our foreign exchange towards GDP. This program has installed electronic monitoring systems and closed circuit video cameras on all Ghanaian tuna vessels. Ghana has implemented pilot fisheries watch committees, an initiative to involve artisanal fishermen in enforcement and management of fisheries regulations. The artisanal fishing contributes about 70% uh, of our fishing sector. 
and this has actually gone along to implement some environmental laws and gear identification. The Fisheries Commission under the Ministry also has strengthened the West Africa Central Gulf of Guinea. Six countries, including Ghana, have established a West African Tax Force so that we can protect our resources in the Gulf of Guinea. And I would like to emphasize Ghana's work to develop a marine protected area strategy, one component of the 2015 Marine Fisheries Management Plan, which we intend to implement over five years. Reducing current levels of fishing efforts, improving information, stock assessment, support to stock rebuilding, and harvesting strategy, ensuring effective enforcement of our fisheries regulation, protecting our marine habitat to conserve biodiversity, and implementation product and certification, reducing post-harvest losses. All these have gone to enhance productivity of our fisheries sector. And I also want to acknowledge our partners, USAID, Ghana's uh, Sustainable Management Project for completing Ghana's um, efforts to improve productivity and sustainability of the fisheries sector. We have taken very serious programs, especially in the fight of IEU, because we believe that in Africa and in most parts of the countries, we are losing about $10 billion in terms of IEU. And sometimes most developing countries are always looking to the developed countries for economic support. In Ghana, we believe that if we can conserve our resources, and if all of us here can agree that we need to fight IEU, we will have enough money to develop our economies. We will have enough money for social interventions to support our people. We will have enough money if we fight IEU to make life better for the people of Ghana. Ghana's objectives are also closely aligned with those of this conference which seeks to protect and restore the ocean's wealth and health. The well-being of shared oceans is linked directly to that of communities that depend on aquatic resources. We find IEU as a human rights issue. It's a crime against humanity. It's a crime against our people. If we encourage it, it means that we want our people to remain poor. But we are here to say, just as Indonesia said, you all need to support us to fight IEU, to conserve foreign exchange, to give better life for our people and for the generation that will be born. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Aite. We, our, our U.S. Navy has enjoyed a partnership with, uh, with Ghana through the West African Task Force, so uh, your leadership as well has been very much uh, admired. Uh, now I'd like to call to the stage uh, Ms. Jen Kemmerly from Monterey Bay Aquarium. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. This is quite an honor for me to be here because I'm going to talk to you about some different strategies today about how the NGO community is actually trying to motivate and incentivize the markets, businesses, and consumers to really drive change. And we heard President Obama talk about collective action. We heard the minister from Chile talk about governments can't do this alone. I'm going to give you some examples of how the NGO community is really trying to make this happen so it's more of a coordinated effort. Monterey Bay Aquarium for the last 15 years has been getting information into the hands of businesses and consumers about the environmental performance of our seafood, where it's coming from. Is it environmentally responsible? How is it farm raised? Trying to get this information into the right people's hands so they can vote with their wallets, so they can use their purchasing power. So far over the past 15 years, we have distributed over 56 million pocket guides to consumers across the US. Through a network of more than 200 NGOs worldwide, 
we are working to advise businesses with our NGO colleagues at World Wildlife Fund, Sustainable Fisheries Partnership, Marine Stewardship Council. We work collaboratively to engage the market to drive change. And then we ask ourselves, in just 15 years, why are we so successful? In the U.S. alone, we have over 85% of the retail grocery sector engaged. And the institutional food service sector, that number is even higher. Why are they so interested? It's because the millennials and consumers care about transparency. They care about where their food comes from, and they don't want to contribute to illegal fishing. They don't want to know that they're contributing to some sort of environmental degradation just by the seafood choices that they make or the contracts that they draft up with a company for three years' worth of seafood product. So they're asking the NGOs, advise us, what can we do? So my next slide, once it comes up, and if not, I'll tell you a little bit more about it. Um, you know, for a movement and for someone who's been in the environmental community for about 15 years, you expect to get so far. But where we are right now as an environmental community is nothing short of amazing. In just 15 years, we have the consumers on board. They're asking questions at point of sale. And we have the majority of the business community engaged. Where we are now is at a critical point. Because now we have the producers. And when I say the producers, I'm talking about the fishermen, the fishing cooperatives, the aquaculture industry, the, the regional NGOs on the ground asking us, how do we get out of the red? Now, whether you are Greenpeace and you have a red list, or you're the MSC and you have an eco-label, or you're Monterey Bay Aquarium and we have our green, yellow, red traffic light system, we all agree on the basic fundamental tenets of what sustainable fisheries look like. They're legal, they're well-managed, they're high environmental performers, and they're not contributing to the human atrocities that we're hearing about today and over the past two years. That's what we're all vying for. But now we're in this new position that we're advising these producers as to how to improve. And that's where there is tremendous opportunity to work with governments, because that seems to be the missing piece right now. I'm going to talk you through two examples of how we're working with the business community and how we're working with aquaculture community on the ground. And it'll help show you how the government component isn't quite there in the room with us and how we really want to break down those silos. And then I think Jorge is going to come up in a few minutes and really round out this conversation. So, Right now, back in Monterey, we have some of the leading food service companies in the same room with some of the pet food companies in the same room with some of the retailers, and they're asking the NGOs what to do. And they want to talk about their public-facing seafood commitments, but one of the biggest obstacles in their way is traceability. They don't even have the ability to identify what species they're buying. There's no mandatory requirements throughout the seafood supply chain about what species it is, what's labeled, what's not labeled, what country is it from, what gear are they using, what fish farming methods. They can't get the basic information. And that's not something that the business and NGO community can do alone. That's going to require some government regulation and support from the likes of the folks in this room can really help us get the basic information flowing through the supply chain, not just to the point where it's landed at the farm gate or landed at the port, but all the way through to the point of sale. So that's a big ask as well. But what we're seeing are tremendous public effort by these companies. So I just want to point out too, Compass Group and Airmark, you may or may not be familiar with them, but these are the two leading companies that are supporting the institutional food sector. So every time you go into a corporate cafeteria or even a stadium for a sporting event, usually it's companies like this behind the scenes that are feeding you. And we've been working very closely with these companies, and they have actually shifted their sourcing of tuna in this specific example to try to support the fisheries and the tuna industry that's doing the right thing, specifically in this case, the fisheries that went and got eco-certified to verify that they are better performers and they're interested in legal, sustainable fishing. And the ripple effect is tremendous because as soon as they made these commitments, their peers in their industry quickly followed suit. And they're willing to do more. They're willing to engage with governments, make their voice heard, and really set not just a food trend, but a clear market expectation that if you're selling a seafood, we expect that it's legal, we expect that it's sustainable, we expect it's from environmentally responsible sources, and that it's also socially responsible as well. I also want to show you what's happening when the NGOs are starting to work on the ground. 
with the producers. And this is an aquaculture example. We have not heard a lot about aquaculture since we've been here today, but in the United States, over half of our seafood is coming from farm grade sources. So when we hear from the farmers throughout Southeast Asia, we're on the red list. How do we get out of the red list? What do you want us to do? We are directly engaging with our NGO colleagues to help these individuals organize and figure out how to obtain market access, how to maintain the access that they used to have. Now all these big businesses have these corporate sustainability policies. What are they to do? We can't just leave them in the lurch. We have to be there to advise. We also have to be there to provide capacity to introduce new technology and innovation. So this change can really happen. So I use this picture because I, I feel like this is where we are. We have two silos or two fish ponds. So you have the NGOs working directly with the producers, with the various stakeholder groups, and we're doing some really amazing work. And we have the government and the other fish pond also doing some amazing work. I want to bridge this divide. And I think that's where we are. And I know that's where the NGO community wants us to get to. And again, I know Jorge is going to speak a little bit to this in, in a minute, how the producers are there as well. So I'm leaving the room here today with a, with a call for action to kind of bridge this divide. And I want to just share with you some announcements from Monterey Bay Aquarium, just to show you how we're starting to use a very multi-stakeholder approach to drive this coordinated action of the collection act, at collective action that the president spoke about earlier today. We are working in a new partnership with USAID in Southeast Asia to try to bring the technology to the forefront, to the producers, to the fish farmers and fishers, so they can start documenting in electronic format what they're catching, what they're bringing to the market, what they're harvesting, trying to build that traceability system on the ground. We are also trying to coordinate all of the NGOs who have programs like Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch with their ratings and traffic light systems so we can better harmonize and give more consistent advice to businesses around the world. Um, I previously showed you a slide of how we're working on the, on the ground with producers in aquaculture. Well, those producers actually, um, formally in July, they formally formed, pardon my redundancy, the Asian Seafood Improvement Collaborative. So they are creating a platform where they can identify what they need to do to improve, what protocols and checklists do we need to create so we can improve the way we farm shrimp, but also how we fish tuna, also how we improve our traceability and get products to the market. And then finally, I want to share also that we've been working with two NGOs. One is called Sea Fish in the United Kingdom, and one is called Sustainable, uh, Sustainable Fisheries Partnership, and we've developed a human rights risk assessment tool because the number one priority for the companies that we advise is they want to ensure that they are not sourcing from a fishery or an aquaculture operation that is contributing to any human rights violations. So this risk assessment tool will use publicly available information to identify the level of risk in various fisheries across the globe. So these companies at least have some indicator that they may be sourcing from a fishery that is subscribing to these atrocities. And then we can help direct them to the governments, to the NGOs, and see the other important people in this room who can help us make a difference. So with that, I thank you very much for your time and the opportunity to speak today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So raise your hand if you're from an NGO. All right. Raise your hand if you're representing your government. All right. Let's talk. Bridge that divide. Thank you, Jen. Perfect. And I think uh, we'll have more on that with our final speaker, Dr. Torrey. Hi, hola, good afternoon. Here is the, okay. The first one, please. Okay. In this talk, I'm going to present the information of having strong organizations to achieve sustainable fisheries. My main focus will be small scale fisheries, which includes 22 million people from 136 countries, catching half of the production in the world. These fishers go to work every day and in the majority of the cases encounter chaos, competition, difficult to access markets, and recently impact of climate change in their fisheries. Legal fishermen don't want to break regu regulations. They just want to fish and sell their products. However, there are too many ways to be legal. 
For example, in Mexico, you can be illegal in 255 different combinations. From having no the fishing permit, the fishing boat, for the boat, to not complain with the correct fishing zone, capture, gear, season, target of species, plus all the labor and security laws and other regulations. And most of these fisheries live in small communities in, ISO, in very far places. Again, in Mexico, just an example, there are 12,000 communities, coastal communities, with less than 50,000 people. Um, sorry. In these communities, the promise to be better opportunities and markets not always arrives as we are expecting. These communities are in constant adaptation to be resilient to the daily opportunities. They change every day. Finally, always the weather. You never know how will it be eat. Nevertheless, fishers always go to the hope to have a better day than yesterday. Um, I have been working with fishermen for the last 25 years, and where I work, we identify, and we work in 12 communities in Mexico, three key ingredients that are in, in the screen. First, are the human development skills for community leaders. We know that in each community, in each of these communities, are a natural born leader that see the common good of the community, but in uh, integrating the environment. Just a small story. 2012, I was in a small community in the Gulf of California and was talking with a fisherman and I asked, what are you going to do tonight? And he said, you know, it's movie time. It's movie night, and what is that? And he said, you know, every, every Friday or Saturday, I rent a movie about nature, discovery, Nat Geo, all these movies, and present to the kids. So then we realized that by promoting capacity building, that a lot of NGOs will promote that, beyond best, best practices in conservation and sustainable fisheries, but rather we develop a curricula on leadership, common well-being, negotiation, communication, conflict resolutions, could provide more effective tools to the fishers if we want to achieve sustainable fisheries. In, the, in this photo, we can see a fisherman that is a, a hero, a lobster hero from the Mesoamerican Reef. He was explaining to their peers the best practices for sustainability. They are heroes. Um, but the second ingredient, we can have great leaders, but fisheries is a collaborative activity. Some of you know that in the sea, every fisher always be helping each other. Therefore, the second ingredient is to have fisheries organizations that are legal and competitive to achieve a strong social enterprises. I want to, to emphasize the power of organization. There are four steps. First, as I mentioned, be organized as a group of fishers promoting cooperation among themselves is key. Second, to be legal. And the third is to be competitive, mainly to have a healthy administration and finances a strategic operating plan, as any company, and key alliances. Then, and just then, fishers will be able to invest in conservation and sustainable practices. In this, in this uh, slide, I put a photo of a woman, a fisherwoman. Half of the people directly or indirectly are, uh, in fisheries are women, and we are not included as much as we have to do it. We are losing a lot of their knowledge and creative solutions to other marine environmental issues. Finally, I want to conclude with two, two remarks. First, small scale fishers will continue fishing and adapting to the daily pressures. They cannot wait for us, decision makers, researchers, and you. They, they are not can wait for the paper to be published. 
or other decisions laws. Therefore, features have to be included in the decision-making process from day one. There is no one here, I think, as a fisherman. Maybe, I'm not sure. As a fisher, one time mentioned in a meeting, you have to stop seeing fishers as the lions that just want to eat all the chickens. A strong, and finally, a strong governance that is inclusive, participative, transparent, with an effective accountability and promoting collaboration will be reflected in sustainable fisheries. And thank you very much for the invitation and this opportunity. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Torre. Uh, I can attest to your passion and concern for the ocean. While before our presentation, we were chatting, and he lives close to the Sea of Cortez, and, uh, and he joked that the other woman in his marriage is his stand-up paddleboard. So, uh, thank you for that inspiration. So, please, what a terrific panel! Please join me in thanking them all again and recognizing for. for So now uh, we'd like to recognize all our partners of the Safe Ocean Network. If your organization or government is a member of the Safe Ocean Network, I'd ask you to stand, please. Go ahead. There's a, all right. Good. Well, thank you all very much. Let's give them a round of applause. Now I would like to call upon the Honorable Dr. Jose Graziano da Silva. He is the Director General of the Food and Agricultural, or Agricultural Organization of the United Nations, and he's going to say a few words about the agreement on port state measures to prevent, deter, and eliminate illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. Thank you, Tim. Ladies and gentlemen, as uh, already have been said the, this morning, the first ever binding international instrument that specifically address IUU fishing. The Port State Measurement Agreement, or PSA, has already entered into force last June. At the time of the last Our Oceans Conference, one year ago in Chile, only 13 signatories have ratified the agreement out of the 25 we needed. As of today, 36 signatories representing 63 countries have joined the PSMA. But that's not enough. We need everyone on board. This is precisely a situation in which no one can be left behind. Otherwise, rogue fishing vessels will continue to find ways to land and introduce their illegal catch into the markets. Let's now allow any port state in the world to be known as a shelter for non-compliance amid our efforts to combat illegal fishing. We count on your support. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Krausiana da Silva. If your country is a member of the, or a signature to the uh, Port State Measures Agreement. Please, I ask you to stand. And we ask you to be recognized. Thanks. Excellent. Okay, so thank you all. Uh, before we move into the announcements, I would like to ask everyone to hold their applause for each one of them. We have a list of about 15. Uh, until after the last, uh, and, we'll, uh, and then we'll all give them a collective round of applause. Uh, so, Dr. Graziano da Silva, you, you've made your announcement. Do you have another? Yes, just to say that uh, uh, we are now moving to focus on uh, effective implementation. As already said by the Minister of Indonesia and Ghana, this is the most important. FAO wants to announce the launch of a global program to support the implementation of the Port State Agreement and complementary instruments. This global program will provide legal and technical assistance to the countries and also work on training and capacity building for the fishermen. I 
uh, it will be implemented through a number of national regional projects and focusing on uh, a small scale fishery. As you say, already said also, 90% of about 120 million people that depend on fisheries for their livelihoods work on small scale fisheries. And 95% of these people live in poor countries. FAO has established a global umbrella program for the promotion and application of the voluntary guidelines for securing sustainable small scale fishing in the context of food security and poverty eradication. The program aims at providing policy support, promoting and sharing expertise, and empowering small scale fisheries communities. I invite all of you to contribute to implement it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now we'll have His Excellency, Mr. Yohei Matsumoto, State Minister of the Cabinet Office of Japan. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Japan, a country which is surrounded by the ocean, has coexisted and developed itself in harmony with the ocean, while always cherishing and standing in awe of its power. In this way, we, the Japanese people, fully understand the activities harmful to the ocean for both it and those who interact with it. Therefore, Japan has not and will never tolerate IUU fishing. Here, at our ocean 2016, I have the pleasure of announcing that Japan has decided to participate in the, in the Safe Ocean Network led by the United States in order to conduct responsible management of the ocean. This, of course, includes the North Pacific Ocean, Japan's closest sea, where a number of alleged IUU fishing vessels are seen. Marine litter, in particular microplastics, poses a threat to marine ecosystems everywhere. The G7 leaders were committed to addressing this, this agenda at G7 Ise Shima Summit. Japan and US will be jointly hosting the APEC high-level meeting of marine litter in the Asia-Pacific region this month. Only global endeavors supported by the evidence-based deliberations and international cooperation can protect our ocean. Japan will develop itself from a country protected by the ocean to a country that protects the ocean. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now we'll have the Honorable Maggie Berry, the Minister for Conservation of New Zealand. Kia ora. Last year, our Prime Minister, John Key, announced the development of the Kermadec Ocean Sanctuary. At 620,000 square kilometres, it's twice the size of our landmass, about the same size as Texas. But it was dwarfed last week, of course, by President Obama's announcement. Uh, this new marine park at 1.2 million is twice as big as Texas, with a big name to match, Papahānaumo Kuakeia, also known as Big Popper. And well done to the Brits on the marine reserve that was announced around the Pitcairns today. Marine protected areas and reserves are certainly the way of the future. But as we've just heard from our learned panel, the sustainable management of fisheries is an enormous challenge, and New Zealand was pleased to join the Safe Oceans Network from the start. And this year, our announcements build on our commitment of $50 million for sustainable management of the Pacific fisheries. In the spirit of collaboration and of sharing information in partnership, I'm very pleased to announce that New Zealand has added two new activities to the Safe Ocean Network. The first activity is called Operation Zodiac. Our Defence Force vessels will undertake patrols of the long-line tuna fisheries in the high seas of the Western and Central Pacific Ocean, where the IUU cost to tuna fisheries is estimated at US $616 million. And this theft is at the expense of some of the poorest Pacifica people. The second activity is a pilot project for frontline genetic testing of fish, fish species. 
This will help address some of the issues that we've just heard about, the unreported aspect of IUU fishing. The genetics will support high seas fisheries management of key tuna stocks in the Pacific by detecting and being able to prove any misreporting of fish species that have been caught. One of the very strong themes that is emerging from this conference already is the spirit of collaboration and partnership, and that if we join forces, we can achieve together what no one country is capable of achieving alone, and that is to save our oceans. Listening to the speakers today, I believe there is good cause for hope and believe that together we can do this. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Now we'll hear from the Honorable Hans Hogabin. He is the Ambassador and Permanent Representative of the Kingdom of the Netherlands to the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization and Co-Chair of the International Blue Growth Network. Ocean leaders, ladies and gentlemen, President Obama and Secretary Kerry said this morning it's time for bold action. And we need bold action to fight illegal fisheries. The Netherlands is working within the framework of the Safe Ocean Network with an experiment to install a black box on fisher ships in order to follow all activities at sea. Enforcement agencies, together with the fishermen, are now working on a partnership to install these boxes on a large scale on all fisher ships in the Netherlands. For bold action, we need also young entrepreneurs. The Netherlands government is supporting Boyan Slot, a young entrepreneur who started at the age of 16 to develop his dream in developing a system where we can clean up the ocean with the plastic soup. I mean, it should be done by 2020. He developed an innovation which is now being experimented at the North Sea, and we hope to put it in practice later this year. Last but not least, we have to work together on the global scale. Therefore, the Netherlands, together, in a partnership together with Grenada, we launched a global Blue Growth Innovation Institute in Grenada Conference last year, uh, in May of this year. And this institute will disseminate all the innovation ideas on a global scale. And we do this in a close cooperation with the FEO and the World Bank. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Now we'll hear from Mr. Andres Ramita Trostoy. He is the Secretary General for Fisheries of the Kingdom of Spain. Thank you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, first of all, I would like to join previous speakers in congratulating uh, USA on the excellent organization of this important event and your kind hospitality. Without any doubt, Spain is strongly linked to the oceans that surround most of our country. Therefore, we will always be happy to participate and to cooperate in all initiatives aimed at drawing attention to the importance of maintaining and preserving the oceans. Thanks to the efforts made by both the Spanish authorities and the fishing sector, fishery sector, Spain has achieved significant progress in sustainable management of fishing resources, especially in the fight against IOU fishing activities. We intend to continue and even reinforce this line of work, and therefore it will be a honor to Spain to be able to announce the following commitment. We announced 7.8 million over four years to consolidate an, in, an integrated control system to ensure sustainable fisheries management. The system will be able, will be made up of, firstly, a vessel fisheries monitoring system that globally and permanently monitors the activity of Spanish vessels and vessels operating in Spanish waters including the control of catches and landings in Spanish ports. Secondly, an import control unit that oversights the importation of fish products to prevent the entry into the market of fisheries from IU activities, including direct landings and other means of transport. And finally, an IU intelligence unit devoted to monitoring the possible participation of Spanish individuals or enterprises linked to the IU fishing and severely punish them if they do. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Secretary General. Now we'll hear from Ms. Cho Shin He, Director General for Oceans, Fisheries, and International Cooperation of the Republic of Korea. Thank you, Excellencies and distinguished guests, 
Uh, I'd like to introduce the actions that Korea has taken for sustainable fisheries in recent years. First, I'm pleased to inform you that Korea ratified the FAO Port State Measures Agreement. Korea fully supports the agreement because the PSMA will be an effective tool to prevent illegal catches from entering into the market. In this regard, Korea expressed its intention to support FAO's PSMA umbrella program. With such commitment, Korea plans to help other countries to build their PSMA implementation capacity. A second, Korea has been working to combat illegal fishing, including revising document, uh, domestic regulation to meet the international standard and establishing FMC to monitor the movement of Korean vessels real time. In particular, the P, uh, FMC was established by learning lessons from overseas FMCs. Third, as a country which has grown through oceans, Korea is willing to share our know-how and experience with other countries, like our effort to eradicate IUU fishing and develop, develop human resources in the field of fisheries. To that end, Korea announced uh, to plan to work with FAO to establish a World Fisheries University to build capacity amongst the coastal developing states. As a host country, Korea will provide $100 million over 10 years. The uh, World Fisheries University would be a platform to build export network and help us to develop fisheries policies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Director General. Now we'll hear from Mr. Ricardo Rigolo. He is the Director General for Maritime Fisheries and Agri Aquaculture of Italy. Thank you, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, let me thank the Government of the United States and the Secretary of State, Honorable John Kerry, for organizing this meeting. This initiative once again makes possible for world leaders and authorities to get together and take action for the oceans. Fishery is one of the most important components for a global ocean strategy. And protection from IUU fishing, protection from illegal or unsustainable exploitation of resources is fundamental. For this reason, Italy is honored to announce its partnership to the Safe Ocean Network and reaffirm its commitment against IUU fishing. In this framework, I will inform about the new rules to regulate swordfish fisheries in the Mediterranean. The new measures in the framework of the European Common Fishery Policy significantly reduce the number of vessels authorized to target swordfish, introduce mandatory notification for all kinds of vessels, and forbid possession of certain fishing equipment board. The main goal of the new rules is to implement, in addition to the current ICAT rules and on the basis of the EU provisions, a new national management framework for Mediterranean swordfish and a much more effective and dissuasive control system against IUU and unsustainable fishing activities. The implementation of the new rules started in October 2014 with the introduction of a more stringent closure period, cash declarations and prior notification of landing for all vessels, no matter of their size, measures such as a more appropriate minimum size and features of the gears. The full implementation of the new frame framework occurred in the first half of February 2016 with the reduction of the professional swordfish fishing fleet by 89%. Further measures have been issued on September the 8th, forbidding the use of different gears on board in order to avoid their illegal use. In order to keep awareness high, a continuous risk analysis approach is intended to allow Italian authorities to intervene promptly should specific or new problems arise and to keep our commitment against IUU the strongest. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Director General. Now we'll hear from Mr. Adesern Pontet, Director General of the Department of Fisheries in the Ministry of Agriculture and Cooperatives of the Kingdom of Thailand. Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, Thailand views sustainable fishery as a very important solution, not only for protecting our marine resources, but also for achieving the UN Sustainable Development Goals. To achieve that, Thailand announced a holistic fishery reform, which encompasses three main components. First, legal reform to a royal ordinance on fishery is our new fishery law. Secondly, enhance many of our international cooperation, for example, the accession to the FAO Port State Measure Agreement. Thirdly, restructuring of our Department of Fishery for better fight against IUU fishing and better fishery management practice. In addition, our fishery reform also include important practical measure, for example, the adoption of our fishery management plan, upgrading our monitoring, control, and surveillance, establishment of our port-in and port-out center, and mandatory installation of vessel monitoring system. Finally, we also ensuring the traceability of the fishery products by upgrading our classification and traceability electronic system. Finally, I would like to say Thailand is truly committed and doing our part to save our ocean. Thank you. Thank you, Director General. Now we'll hear from Dr. Kath Kath Catherine Sullivan, Under Secretary of Commerce for Oceans and Atmosphere and Administrator of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration of the United States of America. Thank you, Tim. Combating bycatch is one of the key elements of improving, improving the sustainability of global fisheries. The United States is pleased to announce that we will join in a fisheries bycatch partnership with the World Wildlife Fund, the Environmental Defense Fund, the Nature Conservancy, the Natural Resources Defense Council, and the International Seafood Sustainability Foundation to provide $1.7 million to enable fishing nations to better monitor and prevent bycatch in global fisheries. This initiative will support sustainable ecosystem-based fisheries worldwide and mount projects focused on the technological, policy, and legal aspects of capacity building. Secondly, the United States has committed $574,000 over two years to develop a fishing boat detection service for Asia and the Pacific region using low-light imaging data collected by the Visible Infrared Imaging Radiometer Suite, or VIRS instrument, a space-based sensor. At the request of fisheries agencies in these regions, the United States National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, supplies near real-time alerts for VIRS boat detections in 86 marine protected areas in Indonesia and areas that are closed to commercial fishing in the Philippines. The VIRS instrument is a highly capable instrument capable of detecting lights present at the Earth's surface, including from fishing boats that are using lights to attract catch at night and may be engaging in illegal fishing. And finally, NOAA announces the continuation of the Port State Measures Agreement implementation training that was held for officials from the Indonesian Ministry of Marine Affairs and Fisheries, Customs and Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and the managers from the major Indonesian fishing ports were committed to assisting with curriculum development and future trainings for all port officials working in designated ports. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sullivan. Now we'll have Mr. Eric Postel, Associate Administrator of the United States Agency for International Development. Good afternoon. The United States, through the United States Agency for International Development, is pleased to announce a suite of new projects worth an anticipated $60 million to assist countries to better manage their fisheries and combat illegal fishing. You've already heard from Jennifer about our partnership with the Monterey Bay Aquarium. We're also pleased to announce that one of the grand prize winners of the Wildlife Crime Tech Challenge called Smart 
invoices by the New England Aquarium and Roger Williams University will leverage smart technology to help port inspectors in all your countries find illegal fish products hidden in plain sight. This technology can help both exporting and importing countries better track fish in trade, providing more information for fisheries management. Third, in Indonesia, USAID will support the new Sustained Ecosystem Assets Project, a new agreement with Interpol, and a new partnership with the David and Lucille Packard Foundation and the Nature Conservancy. Fourth, in the Philippines, the United States will support the government through a new project to combat illegal fishing and under, uh, other wildlife crimes. Fifth, USAID will continue to support efforts to promote sustainable fishing and combat illegal fishing in Ghana, as the Honorable Minister described, and in the wider West Africa region. Sixth, we will continue to support efforts to combat illegal fishing in Southeast Asia through our Ocean and Fisheries Partnership Project, which is assisting countries to establish a regional electronic cash documentation and traceability system. You can count on us to keep working on this problem alongside all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Postel. And now we'll have Mr. Michael Fralick. He is the, uh, of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration of the United States of America. Thanks, Tim. Ladies and gentlemen, the United States announces a total investment of $2 billion for NASA's development and operation of two major global ocean satellite systems. The surface water ocean and ocean topography satellite, SWAT, developed jointly with our partners in the French space agency, CNES, will launch in 2020. As the first ever wide swath precision altimeter, SWAT will contribute to important research in ocean circulation and climate. For launch in 2022 or 2023, the Plankton, Aerosol, Cloud, and Ocean Ecosystem Satellite, PACE, will focus on next-generation hyperspectral radiometric observations of ocean ecosystems, ocean biology, and ocean chemistry. The United States also announces $75 million for three NASA Earth Venture suborbital projects. The Coral Reef Airborne Laboratory, Coral will produce the first comprehensive assessment of reef conditions in the Great Barrier Reef, the Marianas Islands, Palau, and the main Hawaiian Islands. The North Atlantic Aerosols and Marine Ecosystems study will resolve key processes controlling marine ecosystems and their influences on atmospheric aerosols. And the Oceans Melting Greenland Project, OMG, will investigate the role of ocean warming on glacier retreat in Greenland and the interplay with global sea level rise. Combined further investments of $16.5 million will fund several additional ocean-focused field campaigns and competed research projects. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Freilich. Now, Mr. Carter Roberts of the World Wildlife Fund. So WWF was encouraged two years ago when the U.S. started its efforts to combat illegal fishing right here at the Our Oceans Conference. We believe that every consumer deserves to know that the food on their plate did not contribute to human rights abuses or to the destruction of our environment. And any system needs to have in place all the many tools that we've heard about that enables us to track where the fish came from originally and how it was caught. We're here today to announce a new tool that in combination with others has the potential to reduce illegal fishing by 50%. It's called Detect Fish. Detect Fish enables us to analyze using a software platform, trade data from around the world to target flows of illegal fish by identifying discrepancies in the trade, reported trade data between countries. Hewlett Packard launched a competition this year to fund and help co-design four software applications that could save over a million lives each year. 
This was one of the winners. We're now working with Hewlett Packard to build on the manual application of this data in Russia and South Africa to build an automated database using big data to identify the smoking guns and trade data and enable us to get a handle on the biggest problems in the world. We aim this to be launched in January 2017 and encourage everyone here to take advantage of this tool when it, when it catches flight. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. Now, Ms. Susan Jackson of the International Seafood Sustainability Foundation. Thank you. The gravity and complexity of IUU, of course, requires it, us to tackle it from multiple angles, and like every oceans issue we deal with, there's no one solution. But we do know that electronic monitoring and electronic reporting can be very critical tools. So over the next two years, ISSF will fund directly $600,000 to help implement these tools and establish best practices for their use. Our partners vary by region around the world, but they include groups you've heard from today, such as the Global Environment Facility, the ABNJ Tuna Project, WWF FAO, and the Tuna RFMOs and other regional bodies. And much of this work will be taking place in Ghana, Federated States of Micronesia, Cook Islands, Fiji, the Marshall Islands, the Solomon Islands, New Zealand, Tonga, Samoa, and Indonesia. But this initiative is truly collaborative. To be successful, it requires the shared efforts and an interests of governments, fleets, scientists, and fishery managers. And we're truly thrilled to have the volunteering of fleets to put this equipment on board and participate in the projects, the value of which greatly exceeds our cash contributions. So thank you. And now we will have Mr. Rob Walton of Conservation International uh, Mrs. Naiko Ishii, she is of the uh, Global Environmental F Facility, and Mr. Brett Jenks of RARE. Uh, Ms. Ishii, please. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, we cannot secure the future of our ocean without working closely with the private sector. Investment in coastal fishery is both an environmental necessity and economic opportunities. I am really excited to be here to announce the creation of 20 million US dollar Meloi Fund, a first of its kind attempt to attract private impact investments in small scale fisheries. We will start with Indonesia and the Philippines. This fund is partnership with rare and in collaboration with Cons Conservation International, I'd like to invite two gentlemen to represent those two institutions. Over to you. Thank you, Naoko, and thank you to the Global Environment Facility for providing the seed capital to start what is a first of a kind. Uh, this is the Malloy Fund. It is a for-profit uh, impact investment fund that will be started at $20 million uh, with uh, the support of Conservation International as the GEF implementing agency. We're doing this for, at, at RARE for one specific reason, and that is the plight of small-scale fisheries, uh, probably the least appreciated and certainly least funded of all of the global ocean efforts that matter. We're talking about most of the fish that people eat. We're talking about 95% of the jobs, the most climate vulnerable people, and the overlap with uh, the areas along those coastlines where the world's biodiversity exists. This is a critically important problem. This first impact investment fund targeting Indonesia and the Philippines will invest in small-scale fisheries in order to improve productivity, to reduce waste, and to ensure sustainability. What we are finding working with uh, coastal communities around the world through our work at RARE is that once you have good governance in place, there is an enormous opportunity to nudge both uh, the buyers and private investors in order to help these communities uh, make this sustainability stick. Uh, I also want to thank, as of yesterday, uh, the Hanalor and Jeremy Grantham Environmental Trust, which is also contributing, uh, 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 investing, I should say, uh, $2.5 million uh, in order to get this project off the ground. We look forward to working with our colleagues in Indonesia and in the Philippines when we actually launch this fund and make our first investments next year. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Um, Conservation International is very proud to be an implementing agency for Global Environmental Facility, and uh, we're pleased to be partnering with uh, GEF and with RARE in this project. Uh, for us, it's important, and for me as my former job at Walmart, it's important to see these investments in, uh, in sustainable fisheries. Uh, we want to buy fish from sustainable fisheries, and so uh, I'm, I'm proud to be here. And for CI, we're, we're pleased to be your partners. Thank you. Thank you all. And now Mr. Johan Berganis of the Stimson Center. Thank you very much, uh, excellencies and uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, for those who do not know what the Stimson Center is, it's a national and global security think tank based in Washington, D.C. Uh, tech and innovation has been highlighted today as a, an important facet of enforcement of marine protected areas and fighting illegal fishing. But when you leave here today uh, and you didn't take as good notes as you wish you would have on the great initiatives and the resources that are out there, how do you know what really, uh, uh, what really is available to you with regards to marine enforcement technology? Uh, today we are proud to announce, together with uh, National Geographic's Pristine Steez program, uh, a new online website, secureoceans.org, secureoceans.org, that catalog all available marine enforcement technologies, uh, some of which we have been acquainted with here today. Uh, it is an initiative that seeks to be a platform to transform and transition the great technology innovation that is available to us to where it matters most in the field. Visit it, be in touch with us, and let us be a partner to safeguard uh, the world's oceans. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Beganis. And our final uh, commitment here is Ms. Xiao Riccio Blanco of the Inter Environmental Law Institute. Thank you. Uh, the Environmental Law Institute, uh, the Ocean Program, uh, thanks to a generous grant provided by the National Geographic, is releasing today the report titled uh, Legal Tools for Strengthening Marine Protected Area Enforcement, a Handbook for Developing Nations. This handbook is a new resource for countries seeking to improve enforcement of their existing MPAs or to write legal instruments for the creation of new MPAs with an eye on compliance and enforcement. The handbook presents a variety of legal tools to improve MPA enforcement and compliance, together with sample legal provisions that countries may use to implement these reforms through national legislation, international agreements, or other instruments. In addition, the Environmental Law Institute is conducting extensive legal research to support ocean conservation at the domestic and international levels. Actions include assisting governments in the Caribbean region in the development of ocean and coastal plans and regulations in cooperation with the Waite Institute, and the Gulf Restoration and Recovery Initiative by which ELI attorneys analyze the variety of restoration funding processes emerged in the wake of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, translating them in accessible ways for a variety of local stakeholders in the Gulf of Mexico. Thank you. Okay, that concludes the panel and the announcements. So just to wrap everything up really briefly, what we had today is a call for action and, and, and a response to that with numerous commitments and uh, plans uh, and partnerships with the Safe Ocean Network, the Port State Measures Agreement, and, uh, and the, the 16 uh, uh, commitments you just heard. So uh, nice to see this. In the U.S. Navy, our job is to fight and win at sea. And what we now have with us is a threat of illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing that we need to fight and win at sea. And so I thank you all for coming here today, and, and, and I thank our panel, I thank our speakers. I think we all have a, a great way ahead now to uh, um, address these actions and to fight and win this battle. Thank you very much.